<laughs> okay, so that was a bombastic introduction. Uh, welcome to Synth Seeker. My name is Luke. Today we're going to talk through the creation of pads, the floating long sounds that can provide the bed upon which your harmonies are built, often giving that emotional swell so prominent in ambient or Berlin school or film scores and other forms of music. We'll cover three classic patches plus an additional, more modern approach to creating evolving pads. And from there, you can carry the ideas forward, sprinkling a little of your own personal spiciness into your synths, and be able to create pads that are distinctly your own whenever you need them. Let's get started. What we're going to talk about today are pads, uh, sort of the framework for you building your own pads in many styles. The point here is I'm just going to, in a lightning fast way, walk you through the basics of pad creation, give you a framework you can use to build your own, and then show you a few examples uh, of what you can do with this. Let's get started. Generally, the sort of pads I'm talking about are these sort of swelling, sustaining sounds that are used as sort of a harmonic bed underneath the whatever it is that you're doing with your piece of music. They're not always exciting or fast moving or doing a lot of crazy stuff. Um, they're sort of foundational, a building block, you know, of music that you use in your project. There are lots of different kinds of pads and you can build them a lot of different ways. What I'm going to cover here is what I think is the simplest way to build pads. And you can take this and sort of carry it forward and do more with it if you need to. But this will get you 80% of the way there, cover, you know, a large chunk of basses for you. Okay. And you may recognize some of the sounds we're doing today. Uh, because they are more or less ubiquitous in classic electronic music, okay? Stuff like Vangelis, like Jean-Michel Jarre, things like that. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to look at is a string pad, okay? I'm using a software synthesizer. I'm using an analog synth, virtual analog, from Ableton, one of the built-in synths. Very simple. Now, all the pads you hear today in this video are all sort of built around the same sort of um, envelope shape, okay? If we look at the amplitude envelope for this, it's got a slow attack, a slow decay, some amount of sustaining, or you know, however long you hold down the key, and then after you release, it's got a relatively long release. The other part of the pattern is that the filter envelope is going to follow a very similar pattern. Slow attack, slow decay, and then some long release, okay? Now, the point of this is the sounds we use are primarily going to be sawtooth waves, which can be very buzzy, all right? So the reason we have this slow attack on the filter is to sort of take some of the edge off and really give us that sort of swell in the sound, okay? Both from a volume perspective, but also from a timbre perspective, all right? So let's hear this string pad. This may sound familiar to you. So there aren't a lot of effects on this. All of these pads use some form of reverb. Okay, today we're using, uh, what am I using? Realm from Native Instruments, right? But you can use anything. Some kind of black hole reverb or anything long, big hallway or cathedral-esque. Uh, it goes a long way to sort of giving the sound what it is. Let's take it out of here and listen to what it sounds like without it. There's no other effects on that. What you're hearing is two sawtooth waves, so let's turn one of them off. Right, nothing super special there. It's rising in amplitude because of the slow amp attack, and it's rising in the filter frequency. The filter is being opened slowly. And it never completely opens, right? If we open the filter all the way, very very buzzy and that isn't necessarily what we want for strings right we want it to be a little muted so we start it low we let it rise up with our envelope but we don't let it open up all the way and we introduce a second oscillator and these are detuned slightly and you can play with the amount of detuning you want right 
if we turn our reverb back on. That's your sort of bog standard string pad, okay? Additionally, for a string pad, the filter itself that we're using is a low pass filter, but a relatively broad one. It's a 12 dB low pass filter, so it doesn't clamp down on frequencies a lot. And we have no resonance, right? So we don't want any sort of squawkiness that would come from a higher resonance. We've just got plain old filters that are slowly opening to take some of the edge off, some of the buzziness off the sawtooth wave. A couple sawtooth waves, slightly detuned. And then as with all pads you're going to hear today, the filter envelope and amplitude envelope have a long attack, long decay, and a long release. Okay? And that's it. So let's keep going. Now here's a horn. I'll give you an example. Okay, so still, it's the same framework. The envelopes are the same, amplitude and filter envelopes. They're both long attack, long decay, long release, okay? The filter is slightly different for this. It is still two sawtooth waves. They are detuned. These ones are actually detuned a little bit more than the strings were, but that's to your own personal taste. Uh, the difference it lays in the filter. The filter is using a 24 dB low pass filter, so it's a little sharper slope. That means it's going to cut those frequencies faster as it sweeps. And so as it's opening up, you'll hear those new frequencies coming in more abruptly. But additionally, there is a fair amount of resonance on this, which gives us sort of that horn-esque sort of squawky sound, that mouth sound. So here it is without any resonance. It doesn't sound bad, um, but it's missing sort of this sort of blop at the beginning. So we bring the resonance up. It's like the horn is saying wah, right? M-W-A-A-A. And so that resonance combined with this slightly steeper slope gives you a more horn sound as opposed to a string sound. But you can do whatever you want. So you can play with other waveforms in. The primary difference is the slope of the filter and how much resonance is on it. Okay, everything else is pretty much the same. Okay, let's talk about our sort of third pad style I want to cover today. This is strings again, but ensemble strings, okay? And we'll get to what ensemble means in a minute, but here's an example. Okay, if that may sound familiar, coming out of the Jean-Michel Jarre catalog. I hope I don't get a copyright strike for playing that. But um, what this is, is again, it's the pad sort of framework. In fact, if we slow the attack and decay, uh, the attack and release a bit, you'll get the classic high Hollywood string sort of sound. Right? Or if you're, you know, if you're doing the score for a horror film, <laughs> you can go in that direction and add some tension. I'm doing this from a hardware synth, but it is, if we deconstruct it, we take the reverb away and we take the chorus ensemble away. We'll get to what that is in a second. All we've got really is two detuned saw waves. Now the filter is slightly different here in that it is a bandpass filter. And let me sweep it for you. there's no resonance going on right now, but you could have play with that. The point of using a bandpass filter is uh, I want the sort of bandwidth, the, the frequency ranges to be really constrained here. It, um, when you use like a low pass filter or a high pass filter here, it works, but with a high pass, it's too buzzy. And with a low pass, there's just too much sort of low end there that you want this sound to be relatively thin because that's the sort of nature of that ensemble strength sound. And then when we bring in our ensemble chorus, 
Okay, chorus is the original sound with a delayed line um, laid on top of it, a copy basically, and you get sort of a chorusing effect there. An ensemble effect is that, but with a third copy also laid on top, and you sort of get this smoother sort of warbling sound. And there's a lot of um, ensemble effects out there. There's one built into Ableton. There's tons of VST plugins that do ensemble effects or any delay effect where you can get three or more delay lines and lay them on top of each other. A hardware sense, a lot of hardware sense have them. Um, so. All right, so that's our sort of third sound. It falls into the pad framework we're talking about. Slow attack, slow decay, slow release, right? Uh, go with a sawtooth wave, slightly detuned, laid on top of each other. Can you play with other waves? Sure. Try a square wave. Try something in between, a pulse wave, uh, any of the fancy waves that your synth may make, uh, and see what happens. You may like them. But the framework is the same for pads. <laughs> I'm going to repeat myself one more time. Slow attack, slow decay, slow release, right? And a little bit of filter to take the edge off, unless you want that buzziness. But And let that swell up. Okay, so have your filter envelope also swell in the same way that the amplitude envelope does. All right, let's keep going. Those are sort of the classic examples. You know, they're old school. They were made with old synths, with basic waves, and just, you know, not a lot of amazing technology back in the 70s, right? It may be amazing at the time, but what we have now is just unreal. So if you've bought a synth in the last five years, either a VST or hardware synth, or you've even just looked at spec sheets, you'll see that wavetable synthesis is super hot right now. Every synth has got, oh yeah, we totally have wavetables. Every synth wants to say it's a wavetable synth, right? Or offers wavetable synthesis. And that's great. You can do some really interesting things with pads if you've got wavetables uh, at your disposal. Now, what's a wavetable? Uh, there's a lot of different ways to define this and it becomes like sort of marketing speak, but anytime you can take a waveform and change its shape in real time, okay, um, that you could consider that a form of wavetable synthesis and that you're changing or morphing or modifying the shape of the waveform over time. And I've got two examples here. I've got a hardware and a software example. Let's look at this Waldorf Iridium right now. And I'll play you an example here. You can hear that changing over time. What's happening is over time we're changing the shape, right? This table really is just saying at one end of the table, the waveform has this particular shape. And at the other end of the table, it has a slightly different shape or maybe a dramatically different shape. And you morph between the two. Uh, and depending on how it's implemented, there could be, you know, multiple different kinds of waves in between the sort of beginning and the destination of where you're going to go to. Um, but the point is that the shape of the wave itself changes over time. Now, you can make that change happen quickly, or you can make it happen slowly, and it's up to you. What I've done here is made these waveforms change very slowly, relatively speaking. It takes about 10 seconds for a wave to cycle all the way through. Um, and then by layering that... Um, you can layer as many of these wavetable oscillators as you want. I have two of them happening here with two different wavetables. Um, you can then take that, run it through reverb, but plug it into our pad framework of slow attack, slow decay, slow release. Use a filter to take off any buzziness or edge that you might have. Use an envelope or some form of modulation to make that filter open up slowly and maybe do something interesting with an LFO. Uh, you can get some really interesting pads that evolve over time. So let's look at a software version. So here we are using the wavetable synth built into Ableton, right? And this is our wavetable that we're looking at. It's, I can move from that wave through to this other one, basically morphing through. And then my other oscillator has the same thing. I've got this larger table of different waveforms that we can move through. And as we play this, you'll see the position in the wavetable move and be able to hear it move. So here we go. So 
So what does that sound like without all the effects? So let's turn off our reverb. And really, there isn't anything else going on here. We'll turn off the second oscillator, and here's the first oscillator sort of bare. And here's our second oscillator, also bare. So wavetable synthesis is a little bit different. It's not just filtering the sound. It's actually changing the harmonics that make up the sound. You can look at that in the spectra chart here. You can see those, right? The harmonic frequencies are being shifted as we move through the wavetable. So turning everything else back on. So there you go. That's the sort of fourth, maybe more modern way. And wavetables have been around for a while, but they're just becoming ubiquitous in all the synths these days. Within the framework of making pads that I've shown you here today, you can really put anything. Go sample the sound of the wind in the trees. Uh, you know, uh, enhance its spectra so you start to hear some pitches coming out of that. Stick an envelope on it as far as a slow attack, slow decay, slow release, both for the amp. Filter it as appropriate apply some effects like a big, big reverb or maybe an ensemble effect, and you can do some amazing things. So you never have to rely on the pads that come canned as presets. You can, um, but really it's a lot more fun to sort of make your own and make them your own. Uh, I encourage you to do so. Anyway, so that's it. I tried to make this relatively short, but I think I've talked far too long. Uh, if anything, I look forward to hearing what you make with this. And uh, as always, you have been watching Sin Seeker. Have a great weekend.